Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It might appear that these Bigfoot creatures are attracted to the headlights of cars, motorcycles, and four-wheelers. Over and over, we hear of their harassment of such vehicles. This behavioral trait would seem completely at odds with a species of clever apes who wished, above all else, to remain undiscovered. A frightening incident which involved a Bigfoot-type monster and a four-wheeler occurred in 1998 in the Daniel Boone National Forest near the Menifee morgan County line. According to the witness, he and a girlfriend were out riding after dark one evening in October. He was well familiar with the horse trail they were on and had parked near a small pond when a tremendous roar came from the tree line about 40 yards behind them. I was instantly terrified, he said, as this was a sound I had never heard before. It was loud and near. His girlfriend screamed in fear, and he immediately started up the ATV and headed back down the trail toward a privately owned dirt logging road. He reached the logging road with no sign of pursuit by whatever it was that had made the noise. He only sped up a little until he noticed a dark figure running through the trees alongside the road to his left. This thing was running on two legs. It looked like a very tall and large human form. I looked directly at it for a few seconds, turned back to look at the road, then turned and looked in its direction one more time to discover it was still there keeping pace with us. He looked down at his speedometer. It read 22 miles per hour. As he approached a slight curve and had to slow down a bit, he looked again, but the creature had disappeared. One second it was there, and the next no trace of it anywhere. The two were unnerved by the encounter, to say the least. Summer Shale is a small Kentucky town nestled amid the hills and hollows of what lowlanders would call hill country. It is located in Metcalf County, and the scenery there is strikingly beautiful and much different from the marshy lowlands of western Kentucky. Mountains, valleys, and stone-bottomed creeks dominate the landscape that is covered with seemingly endless expanses of thick virgin forests. Within these forests, and scattered upon the sides of the stony mountains and creek banks, there can be found entrances to countless darkened caves which open into murky caverns containing passages which lead deep underground, connecting to the largest known cave system in the world, nearby Mammoth Caves. Who can say where all these tunnels lead and what might be found within them? Perhaps even an unknown species or two might live in such immense subterranean networks as these and utilize them as convenient and highly effective escape routes when needed. In 1995, my brother, Robert, moved to Summershade. His property consisted of roughly 75 acres on two parallel ridges covered with thick growth of pine and fir. A small, rocky stream ran near the house, separating it from the barn and completing the picturesque scene. All was well for a few months. Then he noticed that some of his chickens were starting to disappear. He could find no trace of them, nor any boar left behind by any nocturnal visitors to his hen house, it seemed. They were just gone. He thought little of it, even though our family had found out the hard way back in Spotsville some 20 years earlier what a steady disappearance of barnyard fowl might mean. Chickens were, after all, usually the primary target of any and all roaming predators, being easy prey items, especially when cooped. Aside from the chickens, none of the larger livestock seemed bothered and nothing else on the property was disturbed. 
Nonetheless, as the weeks went by, the chickens continued to vanish, and he remained bewildered as to why. It was not until after two family friends, Tim and Chris, had come for a lengthy visit that the unidentified chicken thieves were finally described. When they announced that they were intending to stay for several weeks, Robert graciously offered them the use of a good-sized camper to sleep in. They took the camper about 100 yards from the house and parked it beside a heavily wooded area so as to not disturb anyone or be more bothersome than was necessary. When they retired of an evening, they would drive to a dirt access road and walk a few steps to the camper. Later, the bedraggled pair told my brother that several times as they returned to the camper, their headlights had illuminated what appeared to be little hairy creatures. These things were only two to three feet tall, they claimed, and were covered from head to toe with dark brown hair. They shied away when the lights hit them and ran swiftly out of view, alternating between bipedal and quadrupedal locomotion. Moreover, each time they were witnessed, they appeared to travel in groups from two to four individuals. One night, as the two were readying for sleep, they heard strange noise, a chattering sound coming from the darkness outside. They looked out very quietly and were alarmed to see a considerable group of these creatures in the woods just outside the door. Worse yet, they seemed to be stealthily approaching the camper, darting from tree to tree. Despite this, every so often, one or two of them would let out another monkey-like grunt. Chris immediately grabbed the handgun Robert had given them for protection. He would have started shooting, Chris said, if Tim hadn't stopped him. He feared that such an act might anger the others, maybe even enough to make them swarm the camper all at once. Then what? They certainly couldn't shoot them all. They noted that the diminutive critters were covered in dirt and dried mud, as if they were freshly returning from a digging endeavor on one of the many nearby creek banks. They were relieved when they decided to step outside with their flashlights, and again the creatures made a swift retreat from the light. But even so, neither could sleep a wink after the episode. They hadn't wanted to say anything about it at first, but now things were getting serious. The adults of the household could tell that both the boys were telling the truth and did not disbelieve their story. They had absolutely no reason to make up such a tale. Besides, Robert himself had seen a somewhat similar creature up close and in broad daylight back in Spotsville when he was 10 years old, and that one had been around 10 feet tall. Surely, if that was indeed what they were dealing with now, the three-foot variety couldn't be all that scary, especially not with such an array of firearms available. Nearly the entire family were avid hunters. How much trouble could they be? He completely failed to take into account the overwhelming advantages that even smaller animals may afford themselves by traveling in groups. He would become rudely awakened to this fact one evening not long after. As it happened one night, Robert and the two boys, now accompanied by Chris's father, James, found themselves outside after dark trying to locate one of the horses that had escaped the fence. All four were armed with handguns of varying calibers. It was best not to take any unwarranted chances, especially in karst country. No telling what could be hiding in the caves. The two adults carried powerful flashlights in addition to their weapons. As they searched a forested area near where the camper had sat, the group became aware that they were not alone in the woods. They could see small, dark figures moving swiftly and noiselessly through the trees around them. The two boys pointed wildly at the things in silent vindication. The men shined their lights to and fro and drew their weapons. The boys followed suit. Whenever the light beams would hit one of the beings, it immediately shrank back into the night and out of sight, running at first on its hind legs before dropping down to all four, then rising once again. They exhibited no eye shine, they noted, and these two appeared to be covered in mud. Robert also related how, when standing, the creature's front legs looked somewhat longer than the back ones. 
The worst of it, he later told me, apart from seeing the weird little boogers in the first place, was that they were intent on advancing toward the group of witnesses, maneuvering their way in on all sides in an apparent attempt to surround them. Only this time, the creatures were operating in complete silence. What these things had in mind as an end result, fortunately, was never discovered, for when one of the things became bold enough to approach within a few inches of James, the alarmed quartet opted for a hasty departure from the area. James later told me that one of the creatures had rushed in from behind him and ran straight up into a tree without slowing down at all. The force of the movement was such that he could feel the wind on his neck. They all considered themselves lucky that they had somehow managed to make it back to the safety of the house without firing a single shot. I subsequently interviewed each of the witnesses, and they all agreed on every detail, and each strongly attest to the fact that they weren't particularly interested in going outside after sundown because of it. I walked much of the area in question, but could find no evidence in the form of physical traces of the reported creatures, nor apparent signs of digging on any of the nearby creek banks. By the time I was able to make it to the site, things had quieted down, it seemed. In the ensuing months, Robert informed me that every single chicken that he owned, not surprisingly, had disappeared. Business and personal reasons kept me from returning to that part of the state for many months. Then, in May 1998, another sighting took place. This one by Robert's son, DJ, and one of his friends, a neighbor from down the road apiece. My mother had recently returned from Yuzma, Arizona, and decided to move a trailer onto the property next to Robert's house. She had immediately purchased three dairy cows to put out to graze with the horses. The two youths were busy entertaining themselves in the backyard on the day in question, when they noticed that one of the cows had separated from the other two and was running around in the field. On closer inspection, they saw that it was being chased by one of the strange, hairy creatures. This one was slightly larger than the ones previously seen by his father, around four or five feet tall. It also looked quite dirty, they told me, before describing the same curious ambulatory gait as the other witness. The only reason the thing didn't catch the cow, both boys claimed, was because it had accidentally ran into an old barbed wire fence and stumbled to the ground. After this, the creature seemed to give up the chase entirely. Moreover, the two claimed to have witnessed a footprint left behind by this thing before a subsequent thunderstorm obliterated any and all traces of evidence which may or may not have existed at the time. They described it as looking like the print of a man, except for the toes, which appear to be split-hoofed. The fact that one of these unknown creatures was, evidently, confident enough in his own abilities to single-handedly attempt to bring down a full-grown heifer says much about the animal's apparently aggressive natures. Not mentioning, of course, the fact that a pack of them had already tried to surround four armed men. The pattern here seems to suggest a mostly nocturnal animal. That they were all covered in dirt or mud in every sighting appears to give credence to the supposition that they might utilize on a regular basis the intricate and extensive cave system that exists in the area. They would almost certainly be omnivorous, taking full advantage of every available food source. Could these mysterious creatures actually live in the area, as described, yet still remain unknown to modern science? The answer is yes. The region seems to be a favorite haunt of these mysterious monkeys. Bordered on three sides by the state's largest lakes, Barren Lake, Dale Hollow, and Lake Cumberland, the land between and around these bodies of water remains largely virgin and unspoiled. At present, I have been to the area several times and gazed upon the many mountains, valleys, forests, rivers, and streams, more than enough resources to adequately sustain and conceal large numbers of creatures such as these with room to spare. I've explored some of the region's stream beds and forests and marveled at the natural beauty to be found there. In some of the caves, one can put his ear to the ground and listen to the swift water running through the darkness far below. 
Much of this region's wilderness area are so remote that they are frequented by very few people, if any. I have no doubt that scores of the area's caves eventually interface with the aforementioned Mammoth Cave system in nearby Edmonds County, which remains a unique enigma in itself and holds many secrets that have yet to see the light of day. One of them, I'm certain, must be the existence of small, monkey-like nocturnal humanoids. According to Lauren Cohen's Mysterious America, in Monroe County, there exists a location called Monkey Cave Hollow. The name was given by early settlers and referred to a strange tribe of monkeys which inhabited the area, living in caves and foraging for roots and berries. According to Coleman, these critters were hunted to their apparent extinction, with the last of them reportedly shot and killed around the turn of the 20th century. I humbly submit the strong possibility that at least some of them got away. Another bluegrass Bigfoot appeared in Montgomery County on January 30th, 2007, and was once again seen by two passing motorists driving down a lone back road in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. It was about 6.30 p.m., and we were just coming home from the store, said Blaine. As Blaine and his wife drove down Paris Pike Road, a small country lane, they noticed a tall figure walking down the roadside ahead, which they at first took to be a hitchhiker. We usually don't pick up hitchhikers, he said, but we thought this could be one of our neighbors. Blaine began to slow the car down to a crawl while his wife started to roll down her window. Then the headlights hit the thing fully. It turned around, facing them, and froze. And all thoughts of neighborly kindness were flung away with an instant. There, standing before them, was a frightening, two-legged, man-like beast covered with coarse black hair. Worse still, it was seven feet tall and had eyes which glowed red in the headlights. We did not know what to do, said the witness. So we sat there for a few seconds in disbelief. We honked the horn and he took off on two legs. Even when he was gone, you could still smell his horrible stench. The witnesses claimed that as it ran away, it had made a loud grunt like a deer in mating season, only louder. The area around Mount Sterling seems to be another window area, with all manners of high strangeness events being reported there for many decades. Nelson County, October 1965 The hills and hollows of Nelson County, where this incident took place, are normally peaceful spots where farmers nestle tobacco and corn against the ridges and cattle graze the gentle slopes rising from the creek bed. Coon hunters pick their way through the woods and step lightly across fences here, and the crisp autumn nights are usually filled with nothing more fearsome than screech owls or an occasional fox. It was on such a night in October 1965 that two brothers saw something which they've never forgotten. One says he doesn't tell the incident to many people anymore. They just laugh and call you crazy, he says. But our eyes didn't fool us, and neither of them will deny it ever happened. While their father and mother attending a school fall festival that evening, the boys had been instructed to go to their grandmother's farm and find a cow which was expected to have a calf. It was not quite dark, and we'd taken the pickup truck to the backfield as far as we could drive, he remembers. They parked the truck and headed up the fence row to a clump of trees where the cattle usually bedded night. As we moved up the fence row, we spotted something in sort of a hunched position. There were a lot of buck bushes growing around the field, and we couldn't see too well. We didn't think it was a cow, but we didn't know what else it could be. About 100 feet away from the object, their dog started barking uncontrollably. Then the animal backed off and would not follow the boys any closer. They were no more than 50 feet away from it now. All of a sudden, the creature raised up on two legs and began running away from them. It stopped under an arch formed by two trees and for a moment faced its pursuers. The brown, hair-covered body stretched seven to eight feet tall. The brothers aimed their flashlights at it once and caught a glowing red reflection from its eyes. We couldn't have watched it for more than a few seconds. Then we both ran off scared to death. 
I turned once to see if it was chasing us, and I saw the creature put its hand on a fence post and just flip over into the next field. The next day, when their father went out to the field to check their wild story, he found a path through a field of uncut oats in the exact spot where the boys claimed their monster jumped the fence. They never saw the creature again, though once that same year, their mother and sister heard an unusual noise in the barn. That summer, another unexplained incident happened. In a certain corner of their garden, something would eat the corn as fast as it came on the stalk. In 1965, few people had ever heard of Bigfoot, but several years later, when one of the boys was in college, he accidentally ran across the account of several Bigfoot sightings in the Northwest. Ever since, I've never doubted that's what we saw that night, he said. We didn't know what a Bigfoot was, so we called it a hortlechort. I've read everything I can about Bigfoot now, and almost every account that I've read seems to match up with ours. Through his reading, he has also learned that Bigfoot are believed to be vegetarians and very shy of people and other animals. I don't think I'm scared of it, but I will never go up in that field at night without thinking an awful lot about what I saw. I believe God created the world through evolution, and maybe what I saw is the missing link between man and ape. Bigfoot returned to Nelson County, this time on Nelsonville Road in Boston, Kentucky, in the late fall of 1978. Only one of the three witnesses to the event came forward, and this only after 30 years had passed. Myself and two buddies were bow hunting, a tract of land we had used for quite a few years, he stated. This is about a 500-acre patch of hardwoods that border the Kentucky Turnpike. We always camped in an old abandoned barn right off Nelsonville Road, just a few miles out of Boston. It was a cool November afternoon, and we had decided to do some scouting. We had walked a set of railroad tracks about a mile back into the middle of the area we always hunted. We made our way off the track and were slowly working through the woods. The area is mainly gentle, rolling hills and bottoms. We were spread out about 100 yards apart and had just topped a small ridge. About 200 yards down the next bottom, something caught my eye. I noticed something black moving quickly through the woods and it was out of sight in a matter of seconds. I thought it was pretty odd as there were no bears in this area of the state back then and we had never noticed any farm dogs or other livestock this far back in the woods. When we met on the tracks to head back to camp, I asked my buddies if they had noticed anything strange while scouting, and neither of them had seen anything. I casually mentioned what I had seen and left it at that. Later that evening, back at the barn, we had finished supper and had turned into our sleeping bags to call it a night. It was cool and clear, and the local farm yard dogs were carrying on pretty good, and the caddy dids were really putting up a fuss. As the area was really loaded with fox and everything seemed to be pretty active, I decided to try and call one up from inside the barn. I pulled the cellophane off a pack of smokes and squeezed it between my thumbs and started a series of calls, sounding like a rabbit in distress. This tactic had worked well for us in the past, this evening, it worked a little too well. After about five minutes of me screaming on the call, the local dogs were really worked up good and sounding off like crazy. What happened next, I'll never forget, till the day they lay me in the ground. From way off in the distance, a low moan started up that grew into a loud, mournful roar that sent shivers down my spine. We all sat up in silence for a few seconds and noticed that not a single dog or caddy did was making as much as a peep. The woods had become dead silent. Not believing what we had just heard, I let out one more blast of calls from the makeshift varmint call. Again, it started up low and grew into that same roar-like sound. This time, it really put the fear of the Lord in all of us. My buddies were begging me to stop, and it really didn't take too much convincing. The hair on the back of my neck and arms was standing straight up, and goosebumps had come up all over me. I put the cellophane away and got as deep down in my bag as I could. None of us said another word, and sleep was nearly impossible. 
we all three lay in that barn dead silent till morning light. Needless to say, not a one of us dared head out the next morning in the darkness for any deer hunting. We got up, packed, and headed out of there as fast as we could. I was 17 or 18 years old at the time, and had spent nearly all of this time in the woods and on the water, and had never ever heard anything like what we did that night. I'm now 48 years old, and have moved off to another state, but still spend every possible minute I can in the woods. The witness also claimed that years later he heard an alleged Bigfoot recording taken in Columbiana County, Ohio, and it sent chills down his spine. It was the exact match. Similar vocalizations were also heard in Bardstown, Kentucky in the summer of 2006. I grew up in southern Martin County, Kentucky, nestled in the Appalachian Mountains. It was a wonderful place to live, except for the lack of employment opportunities. Anyway, I heard a story from a friend of my father during a camping trip. The story is as follows. I will refer to the man telling the story as Joe. Joe claimed that when he was about 15 or 16 years old, he and one of his friends were fishing in a local creek about five miles from where we were camping in Martin County. They had caught quite a few fish, and it was getting dark, so they decided to pack up and leave. They had to climb a fence and cross a field on their way home. The closest house was about half a mile away. As they were crossing the field, their catch over their shoulders, they heard a noise behind them. It was at the edge of dark but they could make out a figure about seven or eight feet tall. He said it looked like it had red eyes and stood on two legs like a man. He had hunted the area for many years and knew what bears looked like. It made some kind of grunting noise and started moving towards them. They immediately started running for the closest house, one of their neighbors. As they crossed the field, they could hear this thing gaining on them. In an act of desperation, which Joe or his friend, I can't remember which, dropped the stringer of fish and kept on running to the house. This thing stopped to get the fish, evidently, and they managed to get to the house. They pounded on the door and were screaming at the owner to let them in, and that they were being chased. He finally did. Once they were inside, they told the man their amazing story, and he immediately got his shotgun and went to the windows. They swore that they could hear and occasionally see this thing outside the house and walking around it. This farmer supposedly had a dog, a German shepherd, that was a good guard dog at night. The man had forgotten to let it out that night, and it kept barking incessantly. Sometime through the night, they all stayed up until dawn. They had heard the dog make a noise as if it were in a fight. Then suddenly they heard a yelp and it was again silent. The next morning after the sun came up, they saw some signs, tracks, in the yard that looked like bare feet, and they were pretty big. But he didn't mention any measurements. Eventually they got to where the dog had been and it was horribly mutilated and dismembered. It appeared that whatever had done this had tried to eat some portions of the dog as bits were missing. He didn't mention anything exactly, that it just looked like someone or something had torn it to bits. He seemed sincere about the story and had an awful lot of detail for such a short story. This took place in Liberty in Casey County in Kentucky. When I was young, six years old, Ronnie Joe, a friend of mine, and myself were playing behind Ronnie's house. We heard a thumping sound and moved closer to see what was making the sound. Just behind a neighbor's house, we saw a Bigfoot digging in the ground with a stick of firewood, at times taking one stick of firewood and pounding a second stick into the ground. Then he would turn the dirt over using the stick like a spade. He may have been looking for food, but we never knew for sure. Then the Bigfoot stood up and walked our way. We were only 25 to 30 feet from the animal. It was showing its teeth but didn't make a sound. This was an open field, bright and sunlit day, nothing between us and the animal, 
so we got a good but not very long look at the Bigfoot. The animal had a dark brown coat with a lighter, almost gray vest. He had large teeth with long, dirty finger and toenails. As a young boy, we used to frequent my uncle's general store at Pilgrim, Kentucky, in rural Martin County. We would gather around a pot-bellied stove, and the older men would converse about politics. One night, I specifically remember a story told by a Baptist minister who lived in one of the most remote areas of the county. His home was about eight to ten miles from where we lived. The house he lived in at the time was about two to three miles from the nearest neighbors. When the story took place, years before I was born, I don't know how far the next house would have been. The area was in southeastern Martin County, near Pike County. This man was a Baptist minister, as I remember, or at least he became one not long after. He said that when his oldest daughter was maybe three years old, he had just come into his home after doing some chores on his farm and the sun was now beginning to set. His wife was in the kitchen preparing dinner, and the children were milling about. All of a sudden, the hairs on his neck began to rise, and he felt as if he was being watched. Soon after, his wife screamed and dropped a pan on the floor. She froze and looked out the kitchen window and exclaimed for him to look up the hill. He came to the window and looked on the side of the hill. What he saw there scared him to his very bone. About 75 to 150 feet up the hill was an animal that stood upright on two legs. He immediately told his wife to get the children and bring his gun slowly. He stayed at the window, watching this being. While he watched it, it stared back at him. He said it had brown fur all over its body except for its face, which looked like a man's as best as he could see at that distance. He said its eyes looked red. He also said that it must have been seven or eight feet tall. At first, he admitted he thought it was a bear or something, but what happened next changed that thought altogether. As his wife returned asking him what it could be, they both watched it walk over to a tree stump he had recently cut. He had clear-cut the hillside in that area. Once it reached that stump, it sat down on it. This is how he knew it wasn't a bear. This man and his wife did not have a car, at the time, so they stayed there, in front of the kitchen window. They said the thing stared at them until it was too dark to see it. He said he stayed up all night there in the kitchen with his wife and children, watching and waiting to see what it would do. He added that they were both scared to death, and several of the children were crying. His only protection was a shotgun or a deer rifle. I'm not sure what he said. When dawn came the next morning, the thing had left and they didn't know where it went. He said that some people could claim that they didn't believe in Bigfoot, but the Baptist minister did because he had seen it and he would swear it exists. I've grown up in this man's community, and he has never been known to lie, drink, or anything. He seems honest and forthright in his conduct, and was in total command of all of his faculties at the time. He's probably in his 60s or early 70s now. He had no motivation for telling any tall tales to us, as he was addressing the older men with the story, not creating a story for us young boys. I just listened in as he was recounting it. He almost seemed as if he had tears in his eyes as he told it. Yet, I did find it odd that he left that night to go back to the same home he had been in while he experienced it. Oh, and one more thing. He said he hadn't seen it since then, but he has seen some signs, tracks of it, from time to time after the event. Again, this is an extremely remote area, and huge parcels of it have no settlement on them whatsoever. This happened in Bell County, Kentucky. I was one of two teenage boys playing near a coal mine, and I noticed something standing right at the mouth of the mine. It appeared to be a gray or white-looking ape-type animal on two legs, with one arm hanging over a wooden cross timber, which would be about eight to nine feet tall. We ran to tell our parents, but when they got back, it was gone. I was born in Cary and never saw anything like what I saw that day with a neighbor boy. 
It was in late afternoon when the other boy and I were playing near a slate dump. On the side of a hill, when we walked up the hill toward the mouth of the coal mine, we both saw the same thing at the same time. The thing scared us to death. We looked at it several times. It watched us and we watched it. Its arm was moving back and forth across the wooden timber. No mistake. Whatever it was, it was alive. We may have been young, but we both know what we saw that day. And I still remember it like it happened yesterday. This happened in Trimble County in Kentucky. There were several individual witnesses, including Mr. Owen Pike, also called Powell, a farmer, and Mr. Siles McKinley. A six-foot-tall, hairy humanoid was seen that was black and had long arms. The hairy humanoid killed two dogs and also killed a calf belonging to Mr. Siles McKinley. The carcasses were found 15 feet from the calf enclosure, yet the gate was still shut. There were claw marks and black hair found around the barn, and the calf was killed by a blow to the head. Large footprints, like a giant dog, were found. There were many sightings at the time of a large animal that looked like a gorilla with long arms reaching to its knees. This sighting happened in Pleasure Ridge Park in Jefferson County in Kentucky. I was around 10 years old and had all but forgotten these incidences in the following quarter century. Listening to the howl of the Ohio Bigfoot struck a real responsive chord. If I had to try and duplicate the sound that was heard, that would be as close as I could come. Oh, you may have figured out by this time we heard a sound. This was in a small, lower-middle-class community that was not quite suburbs, not quite farms. Most of the houses sat on plots of land that were an acre or more, though there were clusters of them that were spaced more like a regular neighborhood. Over that particular summer, the area was spooked by several nights of howling. No sightings that I recall, no tracks, just a low, moaning howl. My mother called me out of the house one night to see if I could identify the source of the noise. I listened. It was fairly far off and difficult to hear, and of course, every dog in the area was putting their two cents in, and there were a lot of dogs. But it was like nothing I had ever heard before or since. As I said, the Ohio recording comes very close, other than there was more or a moaning quality to what we heard. The serenade went on for five or six minutes. I remember it fading, not just cutting off, almost as if whatever was howling was moving away from my earshot. I'll admit, I was ten years old and it scared the heck out of me. My father worked nights and I was the man of the house when he was away, and I was frightened. The performance repeated a week or so later. This time, the howling was closer. A neighbor said he pinpointed the source as coming from a flood wall at the end of our road. This was a large mounded ridge that ran the length of the area and kept the Ohio River from flooding the farmland when it overflowed its banks. On the other side of the ridge was a very deep, fairly thick wooded ditch area. A creek ran through the area that was maybe 12 feet across and 3 feet deep in places. Forgive my rambling. I'm typing this as it comes. I have never sat and sorted this all out. The howls came back at least once later in summer. The neighbors were spooked by these incidents, as I said, but I don't believe anything ever came of it. There might have been a local report on them, but I can't swear to it. This happened in Logan County, Kentucky. I had just climbed down from my deer hunting stand and quietly walked to the edge of a large soybean field. The moon was full, and I thought perhaps I would see deer running from the field. What I saw still creates goosebumps on my arm. Standing 30 feet from me and approximately 20 feet from the woods was an extremely large creature. It was between 7 and 8 feet tall and could have weighed as much as 500 pounds. It had a very short neck and arms that reached nearly to its knees. It made no movement toward me. The face was not visible due to the time of day. I was loaded down with a compound bow and a portable deer stand. I cannot detail the fear I experienced 
getting back to my jeep. I didn't shine the flashlight at it as I was too frightened. The next day, I went back, armed with a 300 Weatherby to look for signs, but the ground was too hard to see track. There were no bushes in the field. There was no mistake in what I saw. A red fox ran in front of my deer stand as I started to get down. The site was a long, narrow soybean field, approximately 50 acres. It was surrounded by woods on three sides. This happened in Clark County, Kentucky. This might be a little late to report, but at the time, and considering our ages, people didn't believe us. So, it was forgotten until I started to check out some Bigfoot info once I moved to Seattle, Washington. Anyways, here is what happened that warm summer day as best as I can remember. It was a warm, sunny summer day, and we had been playing in the woods much of the day. In fact, Jay, the oldest of us five brothers, had made a path down the hill and had just ridden his bike without brakes down the hill and hit some rocks and had flipped over the handlebars. It was also a place that we used to play cowboys and Indians. It was getting late in the evening, around 7 to 8 p.m. My brother D was the last one to leave the woods that day when he came running back in, screaming that he had just seen a hairy monster. We all went back there and we could see nothing, but there was a strange smell in the air that stunk and we all thought an animal had died and started to rot, so played it off like he didn't see anything. That night, he drew a picture of what he saw, and it looked like some of the drawings of Bigfoot that I have seen as of today. Anyways, us boys all went down to where he said he had seen the thing, and we noticed large footprints just noticeable to the eye because it was so dry, but there was a little spring running in the middle of the woods, and there was some soft ground that the footprints were made in. They looked just like a human footprint but extremely large. We all tried to get our mother and stepfather to come down and look at them, but they just thought we were being kids. Still to this day, my brother swears he saw a Bigfoot that day, and I do believe him. At the time of the sighting, we were 12, 9, 8, 6, and 4. As you can see, that we were all very young, and the one who saw it was only 6 at the time. So, you see why no one believed us. I still remember that day like it was yesterday because of the fright in my brother's eyes when he came out of the woods that day. Like I said, this is very old, but my brother, who was six at the time, still remembers it. I still remember seeing the footprints swallowing my bare foot when I placed it in it. This happened in Henry County, Kentucky. Our house was built into the hillside. The front yard dropped off 200 feet to the road below, then dropped again to a small creek. Across this creek was our horse barn and chicken coop located in a small bottom. A hitching post was located to the side of this barn about three feet high. As we were eating supper, we could hear the horses down at the barn making a lot of noise, kicking the barn and nickering. My parents sent us down to see what was the matter. My brother and I went down the hill that led to the road. You could see down to the barn at the bottom. I will never forget what we saw. A very tall, hairy creature was standing by the hitching post to the right of the barn. The hitching post only came to its knee, and the hands were hidden by a log at the top. My brother took off back up the hill to the house, but I stood there maybe out of fright and watched as it walked off. It was very tall and covered with hair. I could not make out many details. The thing that struck me most was the long stride it took and the way it swung its arms, very smoothly and gracefully. It seemed to turn its head toward me, but I never at any time felt threatened. It disappeared into the trees, and I could hear it as it moved uphill. But it didn't crash loudly, just the rustling of bushes. At this point, I took off. Many years before, my grandfather was clearing a hilltop about three miles up the road. I can remember him saying something through rocks at him one day, large rocks, that were thrown with great force. He was a no-nonsense sort of man, but he could never explain where those rocks came from. 
Another time, my brother and I were left alone for several weeks as my grandfather was dying of cancer and my parents went to help my grandmother take care of him. We had a lot of livestock and had to stay and take care of them. My parents would come home on the weekends and bring us groceries and supplies. One night at around 8 or 9 p.m., we heard a sort of screaming coming from the east of our house. Our two dogs, Rot Terriers, hid under the bed. From the west came a similar sort of sound. My brother had a handheld tape recorder and he placed it on the front porch, then came back in. Whatever it was, it was the most eerie sound I have ever heard. I've heard mountain lions, bobcats, peacocks, and other wildlife, but it was not any of those. This screaming went on for 10 to 15 minutes, and whatever it was, if they met, all we heard was silence. We had these sounds on tape, but no one was ever able to really say what they were. One game warden said they were mountain lions mating, but there are not supposed to be any mountain lions in Kentucky anymore. This tape was later recorded over by my niece and unfortunately destroyed. One day, as my brother and I were discussing Bigfoot stories, my mother and father exchanged odd looks. When I asked them what was the matter, my father admitted that they had found some huge footprints one day while they were hunting arrowheads in Hansa's bottom. My mother held up her hands about 18 inches apart and said they were so fresh water was just starting to seep into them. My father then stated that how he had never said anything to us before and they did not want to scare us. There are other stories connected to this road. There are very few people who live close to us. Our closest neighbors were three miles away. And at this time, only two other houses were on the road we lived in. This happened in Franklin County, Kentucky. I was 14 years old and had the bright idea to make money by collecting mistletoe and, with the help of my brother and two friends, processed and packaged the plant. First, we had to find some, so off we went into the area where we had never gone since we moved to this area. When we arrived in the area in question, it was around 3.30 p.m. It was an average late November day in Kentucky. Conditions were overcast and dry. As we made our way into and through the woods, we found a logging road. The road was around 300 yards into the woods, and a dividing line between the two tree types. Once on the logging road, we turned to the east and started up the road. After about 40 to 50 yards or so, we noticed several cows running about the woods and a bull standing in the road just ahead. The bull kept looking to his right, our left, at a large tree that was about 20 feet off the road. There were some smaller trees and a cedar tree also from the road to the much larger tree, which was about four feet wide at the base. When we were in line with the tree, we looked where the bull was still looking when we saw what was very clearly a very large bipedal creature with light brown hair from head to toe. I couldn't make out any facial features and the creature made no sounds even when I shouted Bigfoot and the four of us ran directly to the south out of the woods, which was around 300 yards. We never went back there again, and I've only told one other person about my encounter. I can honestly say that even with the training I had in the military and with law enforcement, I would not go back there even if I were armed. As a small child, I grew up in southeastern Kentucky. Each winter, the creek that ran next to our house would freeze over and we would skate on an area we had built a crude dam on. One morning after the creek had frozen back hard after partly thawing, my sister and I went to play on the ice. When we arrived, we noticed what appeared to be a small barefooted child had walked across the ice before it had fully frozen. The tracks had a definite form, a heel, front pad, and five toes. It had crossed a distance of about 26 feet in steps and went up a steep bank, slipped down, and went on up the bank. No other prints were ever seen, and I have never heard of any other encounters in the area. The print was about 8 inches long and 3 or 4 inches wide. In this area of Kentucky, there is a large amount of heavily wooded areas. 
thousands of acres with little to no human contact with lots of reclaimed areas with fruit trees, turnips, and other foliage, and numerous abandoned mines, some well over a hundred years old. The area of Big Branch is probably a thousand acres, with only a few weekend ATV riders ever on them, which is heavily wooded and uninhabited. My mother once told us the story of where she lived about 15 miles from there in the Big Branch area when she was a child and was staying with her grandmother, when at night her grandmother would place a bucket with scraps from dinner on the back porch, and she thought that this was strange that she didn't feed them to the hogs they kept. When she asked her grandmother why she did that, she told her it was for the hairy man, thinking it was only a story to keep the kids inside the house at night. They decided to stay up to see, and she said they witnessed a man covered in brown hair came down from the hill and take the bucket and sit down next to the well box only a few yards from the house. It ate the food, placed the bucket back on the porch, and disappeared back into the wood. When I was 14, I'd gotten up early one Saturday morning to go squirrel hunting on a small piece of property by my parents' house. This stretch of woods is located in Greenup County, Kentucky, in northeastern Kentucky. The property is bordered by a small creek called Raccoon Creek and a river, the Little Sandy. I hunted this area on a daily basis when I was younger, and I had never seen anything unusual. On this particular day in early September, there was a heavy dew on the trees, so it was easy to hear anything moving as the dew would fall and make a very distinct noise. I was walking down the ridge top overlooking Raccoon Creek and had not made any noise since arriving way before daylight. As often happened, my neighbor's dog followed me that day and I thought I had ran him off a couple of hours earlier. Everything was completely still with almost no wind that morning. I started to hear the dog, Gruffy, start barking and growling in a way that I had never heard before. At first, I tried to ignore the noise but after a few minutes, I decided to go run him off again as he was destroying my hunt. As I quietly eased down the ridge about 50 yards, I saw what I thought to be a young bear through the trees. The animal was standing on its back legs and was only around six feet tall. I noticed that as Gruffy would lunge at the animal, it would knock him back with his hands. He would let out a yelp then go back after the animal. I eased closer being as quiet as possible, planning to shoot near the animal to keep it from killing the dog. As I got directly above the animal, it noticed me and turned to look directly at me. This is when I noticed that it was not a bear. I did not immediately distinguish the animal as a Sasquatch, but was very confused as to what I was looking at. The animal growled viciously, which scared me more than I have ever been scared when Gruffy noticed me, he ran to me and kept barking at the animal. I thought about shooting the animal, but decided that with a 20-gauge shotgun at this distance with a number 6 shot, I would just tick it off. I started to walk backwards slowly. After 3-4 to four steps, the animal let out a blood-curdling growl. I literally threw my shotgun down and ran home. When I got home, I told my father about what had happened. After he got over the fact that my gun was still in the woods, he decided to grab his rifle and take me back to get the gun. He would not accept that this was anything other than a bear. I have never spoken about this encounter, because if my father would not believe me, then who would? Although there are black bears in the area, I've only seen one in the wild in the area. I've been an avid hunter my entire life, and I hunt everything from ginseng to yellow root to big game. I still am not entirely sure of what I saw that day, but I know it was not a bear, and it was not a human. A human couldn't possibly make the sound that this animal made at that volume. We found one footprint about ten years later on the edge of a freshly plowed field. I did not mention this encounter to the people with me at the time for fear of ridicule. It stopped me from hunting the area, and I have not been back since. My father did take me back to get my shotgun about an hour later. We saw nothing when we returned. I have a cousin who claims to have found tracks and had a sighting on the old gravel quarry on Kentucky Route 7. This is a large area that is very brushy and thick. Most of it was clear-cut several years ago. 
I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!